Hi, Sora here from Wizards Code. This is the seventh devlog about my Sewer Zombies game. This game started out live as an experiment. I just wanted to know how quickly I could create a decent first person shooter prototype using assets from the Unity Asset Store and maybe a little bit of my own code. In under three hours I had the prototype. The first three videos in this series cover that stage. But the prototype was pretty good, so I actually decided to carry on with it and so did the videos. So here we are at number seven. I also do a bunch of related videos that are a deeper dive or a tutorial into the assets that I use. So if you see something you like in any of my devlogs and you're interested in hearing more about them, do leave a comment asking for a deeper dive. I'm quite happy to do them. I don't promise that I'll do them all, but I will try. Hit the subscribe button and see what comes up. So back to the devlog. This week I've focused mostly on creating my first mini boss. I've also improved the AI a bit, especially in the realm of hit registration. Jonathan Dare observed in my comments in a previous video that the enemies are definitely looking more formidable, especially in tight areas. But it kind of looks like you could just sidestep them and avoid the damage triggers. I feel like if a zombie was that close and attacking, they'd hit 9 out of 10 times. Well, Jonathan was right. I do have some more plans about how this is going to play out, but I have improved the hit registration as a first step towards that. So let's take a look at what we've done in this video. If you watch devlog number 4, you'll know that I'm procedurally generating my levels with a asset called Dungeon Architect. In that devlog, I created the procedural generation rules for the dungeons, and I included a room for a miniboss. This week, I figured it was time that I created that character. So this figure here that you can see on screen right now is a female winged demon. She's not actually in the asset store. You get her directly from Arteria 3D's online store. There's a link to that in the description. Do check them out. They've got some great stuff on there. So this isn't really a model, it's actually an Uma recipe and some overlay textures for the clothing and the skin and so on. If you're new to Uma and you don't really know what that means, then I've got a number of videos on how to use it, so you could check out the playlist above. The first job, once we have this imported, is to set up the Uma DNA to make her look the way I want her. She's a demon and she appears in our world to wreak havoc. She's one of the reasons that we're down here fighting the zombies and now the demon. Here I probably have to shout out again to Jonathan Dare, whose excellent comment from a previous video called out that I wasn't telling you anything about the lore of this game. So it's coming. I'll probably do an episode in the future on what the lore is. Anyway, back to our demon here. Since she's connected to the zombies, I want her to be really gaunt. I want her to look a little like a zombie. So I'm reducing her muscle tone and her weight and making her face more chiseled, making her much taller, emphasizing her bony features as, as much as I can. Once I've done that, I save the recipe for import into the main game. What does that mean? Well, it's pretty easy, but I do have a tutorial video if you're not familiar with how to do this with Uma characters. As you can tell, I'm a big fan of Uma. It really is an excellent tool and it is free and open source, so what's to lose go check it out there's a link above about how you can create and save characters the way i just did bringing this uma into the game is a simple case of importing uma and the demon clothing pack and then creating an uma avatar using that recipe here we can see her without any animations or any ai in my character development scene Animations are added in almost the same way you would to any other character. If you need some Uma specific guidance on this, check out the Uma intro link above. Next, we need to add the AI components and the Neo FPS damage handlers. The AI parts will be covered in a future deep dive. I'm using Node Canvas now and the code that I'm using and the behavior trees that come with that uh, will be available as open source when I release that video. But that's going to be, uh, it's probably going to be multiple videos. It's a complex topic. So hit that subscribe button if you're interested in this part and you'll be notified when they're available. But if you want to get going today without having to work on any new code or, or buy Node to Canvas, um, then you can pick up Emerald AI. It's a much cheaper asset, uh, much simpler to use, much more um, easy to get going with, but it's also a lot less flexible, which is why I've switched away from it. Nevertheless, it's a great starting point. So see the video linked above, which is how I started in this game with Emerald AI. I covered setting up the Neo FPS parts of the damage handling in the same video as the AI, so I'm not going to repeat that here. 
However, it is worth noting that at this point, I'm using um, hit registration on different parts of the body and doing different amounts of damage in different places. Uh, this is covered in my video that uh, goes over location damage, as usual, linked above. For the animations, I've just started out using the same animations that I have for all my other zombies. Uh, later, I'll add unique animations for this character, but I'm a huge believer in getting something working first and then iterating on it over time, and this is the fastest way to get working, so it'll do for now. Similarly, I'm actually using the same AI at this point. What that means is the miniboss won't have any different behaviours. She will be harder to hit, or rather harder to kill, because she'll have more hit points. And she'll do more damage, so she's kind of like a mini-boss, but she won't behave any differently, so she isn't a mini-boss yet. But I do have my plans here. Another shortcut that I've taken at this point is that I've created some hands as weapons. What I've done here is create a new weapon that I'm going to use as a fallback for all zombies, so if they have no other weapon, they'll use their hands. How you create those weapons is covered in an earlier video. See the link up above. This particular weapon I made by repurposing one that I'd made in that linked video. I simply stripped the images off it and changed some of the parameters around. In the future though I want this demon to have a unique ranged weapon rather than have her hands but I want to get going quickly so this works. I do think I know what kind of weapon she's going to have and how it's going to work but I'm not yet settled on it so if you have any suggestions what would really work for her um, then please leave a comment let me know maybe I'll try it out. The other thing that I noticed in this is that my existing animations don't account for having an unarmed character attacking there's an assumption that you either have a one-handed weapon or a two-handed weapon. I decided not to worry about that too much and I'll come back to it later in this video because that turned out to not be a good decision as you'll see. Next up I added a ragdoll to the character. Now there's loads of videos out there and tutorials about how to create a ragdoll and for the most part they work great even for Umas but there is a key thing that you need to know about when working with Umas specifically. And that's that the skeleton is normally created at runtime. And since it's created at runtime, you can't attach colliders and, and the physics that you need for a ragdoll to that skeleton. However, it's really easy to fix. The awesome Uma team have you covered on this one. You can pre-bake the skeleton using the built-in Uma Bone Builder tool. And then you can work with it just like any normal character. So that's what you see me doing here. So it was at this point that I hit something else that was unique to Uma, but something I didn't know about until I tried this. So let's take a look at the video here. Let's slow it down a little bit and look at the result. Here you can see the actual problem. The character is moving about super fast, isn't actually moving in the way that the AI is designed to move. Why does this happen? Well, it took me a while to figure it out because this is a fairly new space to me, but what it is, it's the physics engine. What's happened here is I created a ragdoll and that adds colliders and rigid bodies to many of the bones on the character. That's great. But by default, an Uma avatar creates a capsule collider and a rigid body on the root of the character. The physics forces between my ragdoll and the collider that Uma was adding resulted in very fast animation or very fast movement as the various physics forces push against one another as the animation plays. It took me a while to figure that out, but it took me seconds to fix it once I'd realized how. You just remove the capsule collider recipe from the additional utility recipes in the Uma avatar. And that's it. You're done. With the basic animations and behavior working, it was time to test the damage and the death for this character. As you can see here, I've reduced the hit points of the demon to make it easier to test. So a single shot from the sniper, and she's down. Excellent. However, when letting her attack the player, it wasn't so good. Look at this, far too fast and chaotic. We'll come back to that in a moment, but it's all to do with the animations and the shortcut that I took earlier on. Also, when looking at a killed demon up close, we see that the ragdoll's not working so well. The wings seem to be forcing the body up into strange shapes and the mesh is being stretched as a result. This can be clearly seen when we look at it with the physics debugger. The skeleton is just being pulled apart. There are various ways we can fix this, but as usual, 
I decided to go the easiest possible route and I switched it over to using animations for the death. That opens up the possibility for me to create a really dramatic death animation to reward the player for their hard work. Okay, that death isn't perfect, but it looks pretty good. For the attack animation, what I decided to do was replace the current attacks, which assume a weapon, with an unarmed zombie animation that I've got from an excellent Toon Zombies pack, link in the description. Going forward, I'll probably improve on this much more. We're going to have a different kind of ranged attack, so we'll need a different animation. But this works for now, as you can see. Okay, so now it was time to add the mini boss into my level and make sure it works well. So, how do we do that? Well, it's back to that dungeon architect that we talked about earlier on. I linked to the devlog that contained that information earlier, but some people commented that they'd love to see a deeper dive. So this time you can see a link to that deeper dive up above. To add the demon into the level generation system, I first needed to add it into the generation rules. I already had that mini boss room, remember? All I needed to do is add a spawner and then add the prefab into the theme. Excellent stuff. Now we have our mini boss in the level. Okay, I promised some better hit registration for the zombies as well. I had previously converted all the AI to use raycasts to register hits on the player rather than the automatic hit based on an animation event. The advantage of the animation event was that it always hit, right? Never missed. But that was also a disadvantage. You couldn't dodge it even if you were 10 feet away by the time the actual hit landed. So this approach definitely improved the feel, but it wasn't as reliable as I liked. And, and it was so unreliable that, as I previously noted, a commentator had observed it in the video. So I figured it was time to fix it. So looking at why it failed, it was because the single ray was sometimes missing. If it was fired at a point at which it would just miss the character, by the time the next frame came around, the animation may have gone all the way past the character and it missed again. So the solution was pretty simple. I actually now have multiple ray casts coming out and they fire off in a pattern in multiple different directions that pretty much guarantee you're going to hit if you're close enough and you are swinging at the right time. So that improved things greatly. I think there's still some improvements to be made. It still feels a little bit unpredictable, but it's significantly better. I also spent some time on the AI, particularly in the wander and seek behaviours. I'm not going to go into detail because, as I promised earlier, there will be a series of deep dives in how my AI works, but I want to get it working really well before I make those videos and release the code. So um, for now, let's just talk about what I did. Um, I made the wander pattern interruptible. So previously, a, a zombie that was wandering could kind of wander straight past you and not see you. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. They, when they see you, they will break out of their wander pattern and move into their attack pattern. So that's a good thing. Um, I've also added a, an audio system into this. So what that means is that the zombies can now hear the player. So if you fire a shot, shot any zombies within a certain range have a chance of hearing that shot. And if they do hear the shot, it raises their awareness level and their awareness level impacts how likely they are to come and find you. So they will try and hone in on where the shot came from. What this essentially means is if you use your weapon against one zombie, you're drawing more zombies towards you. And so it's introduced a new dynamic into the game, as well as having to conserve your ammo, which was an original dynamic, you now have to think about carefully about when you actually fire and what kind of weapon you're going to use. And as you can see in the playthrough later, this, this leads to some kind of interesting strategic play emerging. And finally, the last big improvement is the logic that decided where the zombie was going to position itself when attacking the player. So now they try and find the optimal position in front of the player based on the weapon that they're carrying. But there's still a lot of work to be done here because they all still try to stand in approximately the same space. So if two zombies have the same weapon, they'll actually try to stand in the same spot and they're completely unaware of one another. So I obviously need to do some more work there. That's coming. But the good news is the AI is significantly better and it's making the playthroughs, the testing that I'm doing, actually enjoyable, which has got to be a good sign, right? 
So if you want to know more about how this works, I do promise a deep dive into all of this. It's pretty involved, it's pretty detailed, and I am going to be releasing the code as open source. So you may be interested. Hit the subscribe button, hit the notification button. Let me know in the comments if there's anything in particular you would like to see in the AI system. If it fits my game, I'll go ahead and implement it. Okay, that's all for this week. We've got improved AI, improved hit registration, and the beginnings of our first mini-boss. See you again soon. Bye-bye.